<clears throat> okay, I want to uh, thank the organizers of this conference, and ESERS in particular, for uh, inviting me last minute to give this presentation. Estoy muy agradecido a los organizadores de este congreso y ESERS por una invitación a último momento de dar mi presentación aquí. So, uh, I'm a uh, neurophysiologist, and I'm interested in <clears throat> what happens in the brain when you have an altered state of consciousness. So, I've been exploring this for a number of years now, and uh, I have 15 minutes, so we're going to rush through lots of slides. So these are wonderful books to have in your library, quite an inspiration. All right, so uh, you can see this as tools, psychedelics can be tools to explore consciousness. That's the direction that uh, is followed at Imperial College, the Carhartt Harris team. They have a whole psychedelic research um, program going on with amazing work. And uh, it really gets into transpersonal material, it gets into all these interesting psychic effects. Uh, it, it opens up a world of uh, the mind and the complexities of the soul and takes us there. Uh, this really can be seen as neurophenomenology, and uh, Chris Timmerman was also alluding to this. So, um, this is now a new area that's coming into maturity, and my uh, input was, I asked the question, can I observe EEG effects during altered states of consciousness induced by the action of these psychoactive molecules? Now, um, initially, I started doing research uh, recording EEGs of ayahuasca, and I was invited to ceremonies in Santo Daime in Hawaii, and then with some friends who took the medicine. And I quickly discovered that it was very complex to analyze that data. And then I discovered that it had already been done and it had done quite well by other researchers, so I didn't want to replicate something that uh, other people had done. So I focused on the molecule, just go for the direct action of the active molecule. So um, you need to smoke the DMT, it's not orally active, and so you devise a delivery system and you inhale it and you hold it in. It has a very quick action. The entire effect lasts 10 minutes or so. And I've studied NNDMT and 5-MeO-DMT, both. <clears throat> uh, you all know about this. And uh, I've had the opportunity to do ayahuasca ceremonies in Iquitos, Peru, and also in Pucallpa with wonderful uh, ayahuasquero teachers. So, oh, I want to just emphasize the primary uh, molecule in the Cicotria viridis is the NNDMT, but often the brew contains admixtures and they throw in Wambisa, which is mostly 5-MeO-DMT. So it uh, gives it a different uh, flavor and an experience. All right, so this is just a brief little history. Uh, DMT was first synthesized in the lab in 1931 by a Canadian. And uh, then the expeditions of uh, Richard Evan Schultes and others that followed, and uh, the exploration of the cojoba snuff, the yopo, which is a seed from the anandantera peregrina and anandantera colubrina. And uh, this is what is introduced by insufflation. You have these uh, Yanomani tribe, tribemen that are blasting it up the nostrils. That's a very potent way to do it, longer lasting than smoking. Um, this has uh, also got my attention, a recent find in Bolivia where a uh, shaman's kit contains DMT snuff. And uh, this is about a thousand years old, dated by radiocarbon. All right, so my source of NNDMT is from the acacia tree, Mimosa hostilis. And it's the root bark and you see some samples there at the lower left, and uh, crystals in the center, 
And if you want to make it an orally active preparation, you have to have an MAO inhibitor. And a very good one, very potent one, is Syrian rue, Peganum harmala. So you can also have a, a tincture. We call it uh, Mimosa Huasca. And I've done some work with that, too. All right. Um, this is the uh, publication that looks at endogenous psychedelics and NDMT in humans. It's a, um, a large study, and uh, of course, it's an endogenous molecule. It's found in our brain and in peripheral tissues, and it's been uh, researched more recently. Unfortunately, the prohibition uh, by scheduling one stopped all research for several decades, but it's picking up again. Okay, this is just to give you uh, the chemistry, the relationship of the indole alkylamines, and so psilocybin, psilocin, serotonin, bufotenin. Uh, we have to also add uh, melatonin is also related. And there you have the difference between uh, the NNDMT and the five. The five has a methoxy group at the five position of the indole ring. And then this uh, is just a schematic of the biogenesis. So DMT is made from tryptophan, which is then converted to tryptamine. And it's a two-step process enzymatic. And this all was all worked out in the early 90s. No, in the, in the 70s. Um, and uh, there's very good research. <clears throat> This is a more comprehensive uh, scheme showing all the uh, related structures. And here we have, uh, again, the two-step process of synthesis of DMT. And this is from a uh, Brazilian chemist. All right. So this is, uh, I think, the best study of the EEG effects of ayahuasca. And it's by Schenberg and company. And what they did is they discovered that the beta carbolines, the MAO inhibitors in the b copy vine, also affect the EEG. And they produce effects that are similar to the NNDMT. So this is a complicating factor. It's not just the DMT acting, but the beta carbolines also have an effect. And so what they show here is they're looking at the gamma band, 30 hertz and above. And so uh, red and the hot colors mean increases in power. So uh, this is a very important study. And it gave me even more rationale for just focusing on the molecule, because uh, you, you don't have to deal with the effects of the MAO inhibitors. So this is, these are called brain topographic maps. And it's a difference map. So you first do a baseline recording. Then you give the subject the NNDMT to smoke, and uh, you record the effects, and then you do a difference map. And reds mean increase in those frequencies, and this goes from delta all the way up to the high beta. And so the alpha is suppressed there, and then some of the uh, low mid betas are also suppressed. The suppression of alpha is absolutely reliable. This is the same thing that Timmerman reported. So um, the effects are within 30 seconds to one minute, you see the alpha just completely, almost eliminated entirely. <clears throat> and then it starts to recover in the next seven to 10 minutes. And by the time it starts to look like the baseline alpha power, the subjects can talk. They can start to report their subjective experience. And then if you follow this out for another 15, 20 minutes, the records begin to look just like baseline. So it's a very fast, reversible effect. So DMT is quickly metabolized. So this is uh, some examples of the, these are power spectra showing a baseline alpha and then you see this is around 10 hertz, fairly typical. And now at 10 hertz, you see nothing. And you see a little peak appearing here, which is a theta peak. 
and at 10 minutes, the theta is still there, and the alpha is beginning to recover. It's only reaching uh, four and a half here. Initially, it was around 35 or so. So this was a slow recovery. Sometimes you see quick recovery, and sometimes you see a post increase in alpha. Okay, the other uh, metric that I've studied a lot is coherence. So this is a measure of uh, correlated activity. So both the NN and the 5 increase coherence, and it's reversible across all bands except alpha. Okay, so we call this hypercoherence, induced hypercoherence. Okay. Now, um, these are uh, some other topo maps and uh, also uh, illustrating the induced increase in coherence. You can look at the numbers here. That went from 2.7 to 4.5, 188 to 4.5. So that's a very robust increase in coherence. No está avanzando. Okay. This is a table that summarizes the effects across all bands. So for the NNDMT, you get uh, of all these bands, and then you get an increase in the high beta and gamma, and the gamma effect is the most robust. These are p-values, p and this is the number of subjects that were tested. So these are quite robust uh, statistical effects. Okay, this is just to give you, these are filtered gamma. Uh, at the top is baseline, and now we're looking at the 5-MeO-DMT. So for the 5-MeO-DMT, I've used the Bufo Venom from the Sonora Desert Toad. I've also done synthetic 5-MeO-DMT just to check and to compare, and the results are pretty close. There was more consistency with the Bufo than with the synthetic 5, to my surprise. So, uh, again, a very robust increase in gamma power. <laughs> I need uh, a push here. Okay. Uh, this is looking at the top row for NN and the bottom for 5-MeO, showing uh, the increased gamma power, which I mentioned, at different locations, uh, surface uh, map, I have to rush to the rest of this. Okay, this is what's interesting to me, that all of these activities, altered states, also are correlated with increased gamma, all right? So you have meditation. Initially, it was done by Lutz, long-term meditators, Tibetan meditators that, that get into compassion states. Then it was followed up by Vipassana, a publication in 2010. And then there's a uh, recent study showing that many other meditation traditions also increase gamma. Uh, a report by Stuckey that showed EEG gamma increases uh, in, psych in ayahuasca. So all of this is consistent. And then this is a very interesting study. You can induce lucid dreaming by stimulating with low current stimulation and producing gamma. So lucid dreaming is very much like the visionary experience of ayahuasca. You're, you're dreaming wide awake. So there's a common mechanism operating there. <laughs> All right, so uh, these are just some references. We can skip that. And I'm going to get to the last few slides. This isn't really uh, very efficient at all. Okay, this is an example of 5-MeO, also suppressing alpha. So that's kind of the procedure. You have a subject wearing an EEG cap, and uh, if you're lucky, they can remain still, and you can get some clean data, okay? So this was done in Iquitos, Peru. Esto, es, esto no es muy eficiente, eh? this is robbing me my time. <laughs> uh, ten minutes? He says one minute. Am I getting my fifteen minutes? 
the full 15 minutes because, you know, there was a lot of uh, chaos. <laughs> okay. Um, so DMT 5-MeO has a similar sort of topographic uh, brain map pattern as the NN DMT. The alpha is also suppressed, in this case delta, and then increases in the higher beta bands. Okay, this is the Sonora Desert Toad venom, and so the parotid glands contain the venom, and you can uh, milk the toad and extract the venom. Now the venom is a, com is a complex mix of tryptamines. It, the primary one is 5-MeO-DMT, and it has also bufotenin, and it has other trace amines. So, but the main effect is the 5-MeO. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is another example of uh, alpha power spectra uh, with a good recovery at about 20 minutes. All right, these are increased coherence with 5-MeO-DMT in the top uh, row it's delta, and in the bottom it's in the high beta band. And notice that there's recovery, almost complete recovery, at about 15, 20 minutes post. So the brain gets reorganized. There's a dynamic reconfiguration of neural circuits, and then they return to the baseline condition. Uh, this is a table summarizing the 5-MeO DMT effects. Again, the gamma is the most significant and robust effect. All the other frequencies are suppressed. Okay, this is the connectome. This is where the brain science is at the moment. It's, everything is in neural circuits. And uh, this is what the fMRI can tell you. And now there's EEG software that can also look at connectomics. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, the default mode network. I'm very happy to hear that they're finding the fMRI results to show a suppression of the default mode network. Okay. And so psilocybin, ayahuasca, meditation, and DMT all suppress the default mode network. So this, this is the death of the ego. And uh, this is just a schematic showing you some of the uh, connecting uh, hubs and areas that the default mode network uh, is connecting frontal with parietal areas and then subcortical limbic areas. And we're almost at the end. Another view from uh, different publications. This is a very active area of research. There's hundreds of papers on default mode network. Okay, so health benefits. This is very important. Uh, there's a number of studies showing that DMT promotes neuroregulation, neuroprotection, and um, it's uh, anti-inflammatory. And then I think some of the most exciting research now is coming out of uh, DISH experiments with uh, neuron cultures showing that it promotes neuroplasticity. It promotes dendritic growth and arborization. So uh, this was also, uh, I think, found by a team in Brazil. So this is a very interesting and exciting area for research. So clearly DMT has an enormous potential as a therapeutic agent. I thank you very much.